a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, we got the honor to sit down with Mira Taylor. Uh, she is a master certified mental and spiritual wellness practitioner. Uh, Moon and Ruin is the name of her page and her company, and I will be linking, of course, all the ways to find that. She deals in Gnostic wellness, and it is awesome. This is easily one of the most spiritually mature and just overall mature people I've ever talked to. She's got a light heart. She's very sweet and just full of wisdom. You'll be able to feel the energy when she talks uh, through however the hell you're listening to this or if you're watching it on YouTube. So uh, to that point, uh, if you'd like to go down into the show notes and find expandingrealitypodcast.com, that is where links to everything will be alongside her links to find Mira. And uh, in this one, guys, we go down identifying existing subconscious belief systems that limit our beliefs now. Uh, we talk about the semantics of creating your reality and how important that is. Uh, we also identify the shadow self and uh, redefine duality and then emotional alchemy and i'm just going to leave that there those two words together emotional alchemy which is super cool uh like i said this is one of the coolest conversations i've ever had uh, mira is absolutely fascinating and you will love her so without any further ado let's get to this wonderful conversation with mira taylor All right, everybody out there in listening world, we have a very, very exciting episode. We have Mira Taylor on from Moon and Rune. And um, I love that name, by the way. Uh, it reminds me of in 30 Rock. Uh, did you ever watch 30 Rock? Oh, of course. Okay. Remember when uh, <laughs> Jenna played the rur rural juror? And she kept saying the rur juror, and they kept saying that the whole episode. Anyway, this is what <laughs> rune, rune and Moon and Rune makes me think of. And now I'll never forget it. Plus, it's amazing what you're doing over there. So... Mira Taylor, welcome to the show. Grateful that you're on. Tell us a little bit about yourself because we have a lot to cover. Um, well, thank you very much for having me, first of all. So hi, everyone. Uh, as he has already so lovely introduced me as I'm Mira. I am from uh, Moon and Rune Wellness. And what I do for a living basically is work with people in what I call integrative therapy. Um, and so most of my therapy models are based in mental and spiritual wellness and where they coincide. Um, and for those of you who don't kind of know why, um, you know, those things should coincide for therapy. One, it makes things a little less clinical, which tends to be, you know, most of the patients uh, and clients that I work with are people who have not had great luck with therapy. Um, you know, basically they've gone in and they've done the whole sit on and talk about their feelings on a couch and have someone say, you know, is this how you feel? <laughs> and lo and behold, they got no uh, result out of that, really. Um, followed by the fact that spirituality has inherently shaped pretty much every major factor of our societal conditioning um, and the way we exist in the present. So. You know, the concept of separation of church and state is great, but the reality is that religion and faith and spirituality have basically shaped uh, mankind and, and societal concepts for humanity as a whole for thousands of years. Um, so I do a lot of work with spirituality and archetypal understanding, as well as concepts like duality deconstruction, um, which is basically the concept of duality, which is good and bad versus just understanding that there are opposites or reflections uh, for us to learn from about ourselves and in each other and uh, in the world at large. We are definitely getting into uh, how you deconstruct uh, duality because it's been something on my mind lately and I've, I've got you on to talk about it. Like I was telling you before this, it's, it's perfect timing on everything that we're going to talk about tonight. So, I mean, uh, you're a master certified mental health and spiritual wellness practitioner. It's, it's a brilliant concept the way that you put it as well as 
the divide and conquer tactics, this splitting everything up, it's a very interesting model because it does just that. It stifles it. You only get half of the story. You know, you're only getting a piece of it that then has to be in the case of the medical industry therapy, for instance, it goes to medicine generally. So they're going to pill you up because you're missing this piece and they fill that void with something that'll just make you forget about that you need that piece. And so it's interesting your in integration with all of it. I think it is all important. It's top down stuff. It's systemic. This is why they say when you're getting better, you've got to work out, you got to treat your body right, meditate, you know, eat right, all that good stuff. It's not just one thing. And what the integration of wellness and spirituality allows people to do is fill that other gap. I think it's brilliant what you're doing. So um, what got you started personally in this? Was it something personal that happened with you that you just thought, I've got to do this? I worked for the government for five years. Oh, the lizard people. That'll do it, right? Do you know where the bodies are buried or what? I'm one too. I got a reptilian cortex in my brain, just like the rest of us. But yeah, five years in of just, you know, seeing the nonsense of bureaucracy, especially at the locality level, um, you know, drove me a little bit crazy. But I also just saw this kind of like micro macrocosm that's happening between the way we like conduct ourselves and the lack of trust we have for one another and how it replicates in like societally into governmental structures. So the irony of course being right from, from a psychological perspective, a lack of trust in others is actually just a reflection of a lack of trust in self, Yes, which no one wants to hear. <laughs> no. uh, but <laughs> basically no. I worked for five years learning about myself without realizing it until I woke up and realized it was like, I don't like this. So I'm going to leave. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? I mean, that is, you're always, you know, grow where you're planted, right? And you were planted in that situation and you grew out of it by being surrounded by what you're not. That I love that. It's, it's about, you know, and that's what a lot of this is, is it's figuring out what you're not, what you don't resonate with. And then everything else kind of surfaces, you know, and it's easy to pick through after that. Uh, so how does one go about, um, identifying existing subconscious belief systems? So this is one thing where I think the subconscious is where it is programmed. This is where it starts. This is where you've got to tap into to make any substantial change. You can get all the crystals and you can do all that. This is where the work is done. So tell me how that limits our potential. So, oh man, this is one of my favorites. And everyone, not everyone, but most people when they hear this, uh, especially since I do spirituality as well as part of my therapy, automatically think it's like solely religious beliefs that we're talking about. Okay. There, it's so much more simple than that. It's literally the beliefs you have about you yourself as a person that can limit your potential. So, you know, and I work a lot with people around NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming. It's the way that we use language, um, not just within our own mind, but with others as well. And it's as simple as, you know, when you're going through your day and you mess up on something and you follow it up with, I'm so stupid, right? Like how many people do that on a daily basis? Like it's nothing. And these are the sort of repetitive subconscious belief systems that we end up sort of really distorting ourselves with and buying into and believing because we're constantly repeating them to ourselves. Um, it's also, you know, one of the best exercises I have for people to start recognizing limiting beliefs that they have about themselves or negative uh, self-beliefs is to take what I call a pause perspective every time you look in the mirror and actually listen to that first thought that came in your mind about what you saw. For most people, it's not a kind thing. And that voice is how you truly feel about yourself. It's your core belief around who you are as a person. And automatically identifying, you know, right off the bat, when you look in the reflection as something you don't like or something you want to reject is such a telling sign for how you will interact with the world around you at large. Because that one single interaction right there pretty much shapes every other interaction you're going to have throughout the day just by building that instantaneous perspective from looking in the mirror. 
You know, and this is why I am a big fan of things like little post-it notes and stuff like that uh, that just say, I love you. And that's one of the things that a habit that I got into a while back was is I, I heard this, it was a passing thing and I just started implementing it and it's been nice because exactly what you said, um, whenever you look into a mirror, this is what I do. This is what I implemented. You just say, I love you. Every time you catch your own eye in your own, in a mirror, whatever a reflection, just maybe, maybe even pop off some finger guns to yourself, man, have some fun with it. You're wonderful. Say, I love you and just watch how things change. And then you can do these little like I love you I am um, you know perfect I'm whole I'm strong powerful you can do affirmations and stuff and line your mirror with them and even in the side periphery of your vision it is subconsciously seeking in there and that's why it's so important whenever you talk about like mental health and things like that even videos that you watch and stuff even if you're like ah this doesn't bring me down no it's doing something on a deep level on a subconscious level and it really does trickle in it's when you get really frustrated when you attempt to transcend that and move on to a new level that you realize that you've anchored yourself with all this baggage back here that you've now got to work through and deal with so by People like you bringing us this information with what you do and you're brilliant at it, it brings awareness to that at your point of development now. And if you're young enough to hear this early, hell yeah, high five yourself, go finger guns in any reflection right now and tell yourself you're lucky for getting to this information early. But this is you something you can start at any time. So what are what's just some good advice and some catches that you can give people who fall into this trap all the time, even things that they wouldn't be aware that they're doing, they, they're doing subconsciously. So one of the, and this is one of the best ways to identify some of the limiting beliefs also is to start building what I refer to as the dictionary of self. So there are words like success and happiness that we sort of nebulize as being separate and away from us. They're goals we want to achieve. What most people don't realize when they have done that is what you also have done simultaneously is subconsciously define it as away from and separate from yourself. So when we sit there and we go, uh, oh, I'll be happy when I'm successful, instead of doing that, one, realize that that's a limiting self-belief because there are definitely already parts of you and your life and your experience where you have enjoyed and partaken in success it is only your unwillingness to define it as a present feeling and essence for you that's keeping you from it so so many people do that i call it's called like throwing the stone which is basically it's basically like metaphorically what hell would be right which is to say that you know instead of like i'll call this happiness okay this is my happiness. I'm going to put it down here now. Where did my happiness go? Oh, I got to pick it up again. And so every time you pick it up, then you go, okay, well, now what do I do with it? And then you like throw it or put it in another room or like you have to find something to do with it instead of just being present with it and saying, oh, maybe I'm just successful as I am. How can I identify these moments? And by identifying them, get more of them because I've accepted the reality and the feeling of them already existing inside of me. So those are the main ones. Success and happiness are huge. Um, You know, the way we define gender for ourselves is a huge one. So like uh, I have many male clients who have defined masculinity as something where, you know, emotions are weak, um, you know, accepting the way you feel about things and being open about it and, and, you know, communicating in a way that seems emotive is, you know, wrong or unmasculine. Um, Same thing for femininity. You know, there are a lot of women who decide, okay, you know, I'm not feminine because I don't wear that much makeup or I don't do what this, this other woman does. And so instead of doing that, realizing, you know, that age old quote, comparison is the thief of joy saying, okay, well, how can I define it in a way that's inclusive of me as I am now? so that I can feel a part of it or whole with it and present with it instead of comparing and defining it away. You know, you've nailed that. And that perspective, that ego thing of comparison and identification and all that, that's just a survival and an enjoyment experience mechanism built into us. We have to know and calibrate our existence around us because we live in a 3D world with objects that are moving and stuff. And you've got to be able to kind of target and maintain that. The 
how you know that is different from what we're talking about here is because it's natural law. That's natural stuff. What that other shit is, is fake things that a sick society is telling you is important, and you either fall into the trap of believing them and convincing yourself that that's accurate, or you simply don't. Or you used to identify as that, and now you don't, because you've headed on over to Moon and Rune, and you're getting your Gnostic wellness on, and that's how you do it. Um, so I, I think that the linguistics is very important on this, and I know that I've referred to them as semantics because they're similar words, right? They they can be defined as the same thing, but they have different energies behind them. Uh, a few that I do is like try and do, right? I've got that dumb example that I don't be a triceratops, be a do ceratops, right? And uh, it's it's those little things though, that subconscious programming um, that that really makes a massive difference. What what are a few of your favorites? Uh, wow, my favorite is definitely I have to versus I get to or I want to. And what I want people to really realize that is that, like, imagine that those three phrases or those two phrases are two different, like, trains on the track of the neural network of your brain. And when you say, and if you're the conductor in your mind and you say, I have to, you're going down this track. And this track is the track that leads to all of the other things that don't feel good and feel like things that you have to do throughout the day, the things that you don't enjoy your experiential reality with. And then there's this track that I get to, which sends you down this neural pathway of all the thoughts about the way you get to enjoy your day. And that simple choice point right there literally connects you with either what I would call like health frequency thought all the things, you know, basically your slavery to existence because you have to be here and you have to do it versus I get to be here. I get to exist. I get to experience this reality. You know, I so knew that's you, by far my favorite. I, I, and I knew you were going to say that. You know how I know that is because it's by far my favorite. And it's because it's one that I integrated years ago. And it's I referred to mowing. OK, and we were talking about this. So there's mow today. I have this badass mower. I have this incredible piece of property and it's not a chore. It's not a chore. I get to mow. And I've said this for years, even when it was a push mower and all that, because number one, I had a yard to mow. You know, it's like I, I have that as something to take care of because it's amazing. A lot of people don't have yards, you know? And so it is It is something I'd say all the time. I don't have to go do this interview. I get to talk to Mira Taylor tonight, you know, and I'm so pumped about it. And this is amazing. So it's these things and there's energy behind it. And I, I think that you're, you're definitely right about the mindset as well because it makes everything. And we talk about this a lot on the show because mindset matters. And whenever you uh, do things like uh, you just take an optimistic turn for everything, it's that old... Uh, you know, saying that, you know, one step forward, two steps back is not set back. It's the cha-cha, right? And it's, you know, if you trip down some stairs or whatever, don't, don't say, ah, and freak out. You know, if you're okay, you're okay. And you say, damn, I got down those stairs super fast. That was amazing. And it's that. It's that little twist uh, in your reality. And you start with small pieces, you know. So how do people start to integrate this in real time in their own lives to see the biggest differences? So one precursor I'll give to this is watch out for toxic positivity. That's a thing. <laughs> and that is to say, for people who don't know, it's basically what, what I teach is the concept of balancing thoughts. So it's to find your neutral. Uh, NLP is all about understanding that the world is full of information and that it's your choice when it, once it enters your mind what you do with it. But the most basic and rational place to start from consciously is neutrality. So the concept of toxic positivity is basically, uh, you know, never, you're never allowed to be upset about anything. And the irony is that it turns you into a person who, if you ever have a bad thought about anyone or anything, or even yourself, you end up being mean to yourself because you did it. <laughs> Interesting. So yes, that's I something know exactly for people to be aware of because it's this weird space that I've been noticing as I continue to work with clients who basically have been like, well, no, I'm putting the positive spin on it. And I'm like, well, sometimes you just have to take it as information. Sometimes putting the forcing yourself to put the positive spin on it is forcing you to also not like the person who originally took in the information and like reject larger parts of yourself. So that's a whole thing. But what I refer to as far as balancing thoughts is basically it's to say, okay, I perceived this thought this way. 
how can I construct it using language intentionally to create a positive thought and then a more neutral thought? And then which of these things gives me the most information or do I get more information from being able to compare and contrast my ability to be more intentional with language and how it shapes my perception of an event? It's amazing. Do you ever outsource some uh, healing methods to other people as far as like, do you have a community and a network of folks that like one person does sound healing or something like that? And you feel like, okay, we've got this going on and I'm going to add that to your prescription basically. So I, be I believe in, in specialists. <laughs> um, I, I grew up under a mom who was a vet and ironically, she worked at a lot of clinics where she got in trouble all the time for like sending people to the specialist. Um, but there are specialists for a reason. So yes, I, uh, have people that I work with who are, you know, mostly energy healer based. I do some energy work, but most of what I do is, uh, is more along the lines of the subconscious mediumship. Um, and then I also, one of the major ones that I work with is someone who's a, a sex and self-love intimacy coach or healer. Um, and I actually work with her myself, but I also send clients to her as well because sexuality, especially through the way we're societally constructed for it and the mindset we're given that has been both politically and uh, faith-based, you know, kind of programmed into us. 100% has so much to do with our mental health. You know, it's, it's a human facet of life that we're going to be sexual, whether it's with ourselves or with other people. And so um, that's someone that I refer to all the time. And I've also referred to uh, hypnotherapy. I think hypnotherapy for specific uh, things can be a highly effective healing modality for people, depending on what their blockages are as well. It's a brilliant model, and I love the altruism with it. Have you thought of starting like an Angie's list for spiritual healing, you know, to where <laughs> you could find local people and everybody kind of signs up and you give star ratings and stuff like that? I haven't, but that's an awesome idea. The goal right it. now is a, is a book, actually, and, a, and I have a book and a course um, that I'm working on so that hopefully people will be able to, you know, even if you don't want to see someone private session wise, you can at least access the course um, or buy the, the guided journaling book and do some some self-exploration and some self-healing very cool uh i will of course have you back on whenever all that gets rolled out and then um we'll link all that stuff Good incentive. And of course how to find you <laughs> oh no you're wonderful you're gonna you're soul tribe anyway we got a, we got a lot uh, to talk about for sure so i want to talk about duality so this concept of duality of this like good bad dark light yin yang all that stuff i've been really uh playing with this lately and i've you know First on your spiritual journey, usually, one of the first things that you come across is this concept that it's not good or bad, it's what serves you and what doesn't serve you, which I'm a big fan of, I'm a big subscriber to that. That allows judgment not to play into something that you do that's maybe not a little bit taboo, which, you know, um, I've also had a guest on uh, Jenny Rivers that talked about taboos being guardians to secret knowledge. So it's, there's that whole thing, you know, and just trusting your intuition and all that. Now, uh, whenever you talk about duality as a concept in spirituality, usually now I've gotten to the point where I've zoomed out even further a little bit and uh, see it as one thing. It's one entity playing roles here for your development. Uh, what is your, what are your thoughts on duality? So my thoughts on duality is that it's basically a mirror for everyone to learn from. Um, the, it's funny. I just did a, a guest blog post on where the concept of decon, like negative or destructive duality came from, which is, you know, the concept basically of right or wrong, moral or, or immoral, um, good versus evil, villain versus hero, you know, the concept of God versus the devil, all of that. The irony being that all of those forms of duality were actually born from the coining of the term Satan. <laughs> that makes sense. Now, a lot of people go, what do you mean? We all know who Satan is. It's like, uh, you know, the emanation of evil. It's what's against God. The original term Satan actually came from Greco-Roman times when political figures would have someone who opposed their ideology or the concept that they thought either philosophically or politically, that was, that was a Satan to you. So basically the word Satan bore the concept of the adversary, mm. which is someone that is separate and 
opposing in a offensive way to you, which created that first construct of like you and I are separate and there's no unity between us unless we can affirm ideologies to one another. And if you can't affirm my ideology, then you're a Satan. (laughs) You know, and it's just different. It's just a part of it. It's just what you identify with and what you choose to experience. It's just an option, right? It's not uh, good or bad. There's no judgment in it. And I like because uh, we also on the show here talk a lot about alternative histories and how you've been lied to pretty much in every arena. So why wouldn't this hold true for meanings of things? And, you know, you can kind of trace lineages back to uh, the where the etymology became so divisive and divisive and then it lost its uh truth, which was just that it's part of the same thing. It's like you said, mirrors of of what you either need to work on or choose to experience, which is probably the same thing, right? At a higher level, you chose to come to the It's duality to me, if I could, you know, sort of put it into words, because it really is more of a intuitive self-exploration when you are engaging with it, but it's the medium through which we learn about ourselves through others. So, the concept of duality was truly born from being able to see ourselves in one another. And it wasn't until this more negative construct of duality came along that separated us, that made us view each other as, you know, nothing that's correlated to one another that made it difficult for us to actually learn about ourselves and ironically created that split in the psyche also. So that kind of plays into the whole micro macro thing, which is to say that if, I split my conscious connection to you as a person outside of me. That inherently means that I've made a split within my own consciousness within myself as a micro of the universe. So the more opposition we find in our daily life, the more we're actually fracturing ourselves. And isn't it, uh, I view it as uh, also just opportunities to be greater, grander versions of who you really are. And so it's just opportunities. You These things will pop around and they cycle through. You just occur, you just revisit them or re-greet them as they come about with a new sense of perspective from a higher level of consciousness. And so you're able really to, I mean, you'll Tai Chi stuff, you know, and that's why you get more mellow. That's why things become easier. That's why you get more patient is because you've done all that shit before and it's frustrating. So you just choose a different, you choose a different different way of interacting with that moment and that they occur a lot less frequency uh frequently because they move on to somebody whose attention they can actually harness for a little bit right exactly so that's the irony too is like the kinder you become within yourself to yourself the less interest the exterior has in engaging in a way that is showing you that reflection because it no longer needs to show you that reflection for you to learn how to be nice to yourself, which ironically was the point the entire time anyway. Yeah, it's that old thing from the movies, right? You've had it in you all along. Uh, and, you know, it's that, that concept of like attracts like. I mean, that's just what it is. It's what you and for just sake of and we use terms like vibrate at and resonate with and all that stuff. And it's just a way of articulating kind of your vibe, dude, your, your feeling, how you're interacting with the world around you. And really what it, that is, is how you interact with yourself. The outer world projects that which you believe about yourself. And it's these black belt concepts in reality that really uh, are when you start playing around and that's when it starts to get really fun. So what's like the craziest, coolest thing that you've been able to bring about or manifest for a different, for lack of a better word in your life deliberately? Wow. Uh, So deliberately. You were like, I want that shit. Give me that shit. And that shit came. (laughs) Um, the reignation of the divine in humanity and I'm watching it happen. <laughs> oh shit. Okay. That's a hard flex. You're going to definitely have to go on on that. Go ahead. It wasn't, it, it was me, my, myself and I, yes. it's the way I see it. <laughs> you, you're responsible for the shit storm that's going on then. That's well, really, but the... you know, I don't view myself as just a singular entity right. anymore. So it's, right. it's waking up to realize too, like, yeah, that's another funny one. Um, you know, the, we're all taught from a very young age that we're supposed to be humble and that pride is wrong. I dare anyone to look up the definition of humble and after reading it go, yeah, that's what I want to be. <laughs> because it literally is described as a low sense of self, um, 
a, a belittling of, of, you know, who you are as a person, basically. Um, and yes, of course, there's a wrong side to pride, but there's also like the more you're incapable of being proud of the things that you accomplish, the less kind you are to yourself. It takes a decent amount of self worth and self pride to actually be be kind to yourself and to be able to be proud of others like no one's sitting there going like wow it's really a sin that uh jack's real proud of tommy over there for his football game last weekend but when you do it within yourself people have this subconscious belief that it's inherently wrong and it's that that's what you're here to fix you know this is what your job is guys everybody right now and i've talked to a lot of people who empathize with this specifically they're like the only one in their family waking up right and we understand now that the concept of a black sheep is really a star seed that's planted in that arena in that environment to grow up around that to be stronger to then you know go out and help more people as the idea goes and so if you find yourself in that position just embrace it love it you're going to be fine deep breath you're going to get through it and reach out to Mira. Uh, everything, of course, will be linked in the show notes on how to find you. But it's it's the concept of just your experiential nature here that that's where I'm at with this. And it's people like you that are these lighthouses out here that offer a warm way to invite people to really g- give themselves back to themselves because that's what this is. It's just a forgetting. It's a, you know, a delusion. It's 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 all an illusion, but you're here to remember that. And you're a cheat code in the matrix, Mira. <laughs> I'll take I'll take that. Uh, I'll be happy to be a ghost in the Matrix. That's uh, that's actually how they refer to Sophia in Gnosticism. <laughs> See, exactly. No, that is exactly what this is. I mean, these are uh, cheat codes. That's it. You're you're a fucking Matrix ninja, dude. You're awesome. So here's a fun one. Why is it cheating? Because that's a limiting self. That that's a negative limiting self belief in and of itself, actually. Because are you cheating or are you working smarter, not harder? See, that's what I'm talking about. Like, the, it, it's that whole idea of, like, I have to memorize math equations. No, you don't, dude. You can pull that up on a calculator or on your phone or something like that, right? It, it's about how you're able to acquire the information that you need. And I think the best harnessing of that superpower that's deliberately snuffed in the education system is your intuition and harnessing your ability to discern and to make decisions for yourself. This is why like they say like when a little kid's trying to stand up on a chair or something like don't run over and help his ass. Let him do it for himself. It builds these subconscious confidence things on a deep level. And and don't manifest him falling and breaking his arm because of your fear and your own (laughs) Exactly. Don't put your shit on them. That's it. If you're a parent now, that's your job now. If you're a kid now, your job is to break free of that. Because that old saying, and I love this saying, because it, it it's that it happened in my family until it happened to me. and Or for me is how I changed that, because I definitely believe in that. Nothing happens to you, it happens for you. Again, back to the semantics part of it. So uh, tell me what emotional alchemy is, because that's easily one of the coolest couple of words together that I've ever heard. <laughs> So emotional alchemy is understanding um, firstly about the mind body connection, which is basically, you know, in layman's terms to simplify that emotions are energy and that they pass through and exist within our body as energetic systems. So an emotion itself, if you could visualize it, you know, and this is, I talk a lot about scientific imagination and visualization as well. But if you could visualize an emotion as an energetic part of of your body, it's basically understanding, okay, this is just a resource and how I perceive and, you know, transform or utilize this energy within me is my choice. So ironically, it also plays into the more positive aspects of duality, which is to say many of us. Uh, do the bad duality thing, (laughs) not to duality, duality, but we do the bad duality thing where we basically say, okay, the sadness is bad. Anger is bad. um, You know, whatever other emotions that society has told us are a waste of time. Okay. That's bad. I'm going to push that away. And I'm not going to have any sort of positive engagement or resource with it. So the metaphor I always use is realistically, it's more like thinking about your emotions as, you know, workers that exist under you. So if you're the CEO of of your body and let's say anger keeps coming to the door and like knocking at your door and be like, Hey, I really got to talk to you about something. And you never make time for anger. Eventually anger just goes around you to your higher ups. Damn. (laughs) Which 
is how we like to to put that in perspective as a person is reactive anger. It's the it's the side of anger that comes out where you feel totally out of control and you don't feel like you had anything productive from it. And so it becomes a destructive energetic force inside of your body. But the reality is that anger actually, if you pay attention to it from a place that's neutral, like a third party observer perspective, if you can do the pause perspective as you begin to feel anger in your body or an, or an energy like anger, you can say, what does this feel like? This feels like, you know, oftentimes it has a very similar feeling to adrenaline. It gives you like a really pumped up, you know, I, I can do anything sort of feeling and it's taking that pause and turning inward and having a dialogue with your anger as the fragmented part of you it's become to help it understand how it can actually show up for you in a way that's constructive. Damn. <laughs> this is such a so, great way to put that. God. You basically are going to like open the door to anger who's been knocking at it for a while and you've been telling it you have a meeting or like been sending it your out of office message. I think you have my stapler. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you let it in and you go, let's talk about this. Okay. I hear what you have to say, but the way you're presenting it really isn't going to get us what we're both looking for. <laughs> let's have a conversation. Let's like, these are the only things you should ever be compromising with is your own emotions and your own fragments within self so that they can integrate back into the whole and feel heard. And so that you can be more intentional and responsive in your experiential reality, because all of a sudden now anger is a resource that has a lot of things to contribute for you. As long as you can have that internal dialogue and transform that energy into something that you actually want to utilize. So let's say you like get really angry at someone on the roadway and you feel that anger rising up within you. But you do the pause perspective and you say, hey, anger, I hear you. But you know what? We're going to be at the gym in like 30 minutes. Let's use that then. I love this concept. And that's a great one to start with is that right there, the on the road one, because I've talked about this whenever they f do that, don't flip them off or you're welcome to or try to be a greater, greater version of yourself in that moment. You have the opportunity to so you take yourself up on that and just, you know, wish them well, say, you know what, go ahead, uh, be safe out there because it's crazy, you know, and just get where you're going safely and wish them well. This is how you transcend it because you're not taking on that bullshit. You know, you being reactive to that situation is just that going inward and then handling it and then and reappropriating it, especially that's great. You kind of like talk yourself into, all right, look, in 10 minutes, we're going to be somewhere where we can deal with this. Okay. So just pump the brakes a little bit. And by that time you're over it anyway, it's not even a thing anymore. Yeah, exactly. So you still have that energy within your body, but now it's not coming forth in a way that is making you feel tense or contributing to like nervous system damage or all of these other things that reactive behavior does to us. Because the other thing that happens with reactive behavior is we get really angry in the moment. And then 10 minutes later, we get angry at our, ourselves for being angry. <laughs> I, I have a ridiculous metaphor I was just thinking of with this. I'm not a Pokemon fan, but I'm going to say this. It's like whenever your anger is, it's the same entity, but it changes into the big version of itself when it's pumped up and ready to fight, right? But if you just calm it down, it'll shrink back into itself, into a smaller, cute, cuddly version of itself that like you want to hang out with, right? So it's like the same entity, but it just swells up like the Hulk into this thing. That's a great metaphor for your anger issues, right? Is that it's this beast within, but if you can reappropriate it and kind of matrishka doll it back down to something adorable, everybody'd like it a lot better. Yes, exactly. So the, the irony is, too, that this kind of plays into like some of the dualistic concepts of things like sin as well, which when you look at like when I look at it from an NLP perspective now, these are all words that can be other words just with shame not attached to them. Yes, thank you. I love that. So wrath is just what happens to your anger when you constantly reject it and tell yourself that it's like an immoral or wrong thing to ever be angry lust is sexuality with a lot of shame attached to it um greed is the concept of like lack, fearing right. abundance yeah. right or, or fearing a lack of abundance because basically greed is born from the sense that there isn't enough and so i'm gonna hoard whatever i can for myself whereas if you lived in a concept of abundance greed would disappear you would just be living in a state of abundance so 
there are so many words that we have like these subconscious definitions for, especially in regard to our emotions that make us automatically and, and like subconsciously just say, nope, you're bad. I want nothing to do with you. But the irony is also that when you push anger away, you also are pushing all of your other emotions away. So the more you push away something like anger, the more you also push away the concept of something like joy. Because you're making that spectrum of experience just that much smaller for yourself. Yeah, they can be both. Like people who are crying when they're laughing or something like that. That's oh, tears is a great one. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people will cry at things and have this subconscious automatic belief that they must be sad. Yes, but yes. There are so many things that we cry about that have nothing to do with being sad. So this happens a lot with me with clients. <laughs> I promise it's a good thing <laughs> that I'm making people cry. Go, if but, you need a good sob fest, uh, give Mira a call. Uh, she'll be linked in the show notes. So the way I usually describe it to people is, you know, as I'm working through some of these concepts and people start to realize what they've been doing to themselves, a lot of times, and it did for me too when I started doing this work, they'll start crying and they'll like apologize for crying. And I will look at them and I go, you know, have you had a child? basically. And, and a lot of them will say yes, or, you know, they've been to the birth of a child or they've experienced that in their life. And I ask them, did you cry? Yeah, almost always. So crying at the rebirth of yourself doesn't have to be the sad thing. You know, there's a part of us that's sad because we realize what we've been doing to ourselves. But the majority of my clients that are crying in session, I, I help them to realize, no, you're actually crying because yourself is like, holy crap, they're actually getting it. We get to be nice to ourselves now. <laughs> like I don't have to watch through the, through the lens of higher self and, and just be sitting here wondering when this part of me will actually remember how to love itself again. Fascinating point you just made, but it's, it's, it's also very interesting that the, that physical expression pops up in such a wide range of emotions. Like you can be elated, joyous, sad, um, in mourning, uh, happy, smiling, you know, seeing somebody, uh, again, joy and elation. It, it covers the gamut, but it expresses itself in that way physically. I, I don't understand it, uh, but it's very interesting. What do you think tears are all about? So tears are water and water is always archetypally connected with emotion. Um, so, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense that when we are feeling any super strong emotion, that the biological response is to produce something water related. <laughs> um, but of course, too, you know, we I, I mean, that's such a that's a that's actually a really big topic from the micro macro perspective. But it plays back into the concept of sin as well, in the sense that um, sin actually originally was the name for the god of the moon or the emanate the emanatory spirit of the moon hmm. now most of us know that the moon is very connected to the ocean and water it's the thing that moves the emotive body of the earth and it is also pretty much always archetypally connected to things like the intuition the feminine the Tao, you know the the nothingness so again, we have done this thing where we've subconsciously defined things like intuition, our emotive body, you know, all of these things that exist within us as wrong <laughs> or something that we're supposed to expel from ourselves or exercise from ourselves. Yeah. It's kind of like when people say bless you when you sneeze because of the idea that it's your soul trying to escape and you're like, ah, I'm getting, get back in there, you, or it's like a demon that you're sneezing out or something like that. Uh, so what do you think, though, about uh, all of the, the stuff going on right now as far as the ascension process? Are you are you dialed into any of that? I mean, you've you've probably seen a significant uptick in the amount of people reaching out to you uh, with uh, spiritual confusion. They're, tr they're just trying to figure it out. They're trying for answers because you're a great lighthouse again uh, for that. So uh, what do you think all of this is? What do you think you did this for? So I think it's basically to bring all the fragments back together. Um, you know, I don't know how many people are interested in, in quantum physics or quantum mechanics or the concept of dimensional rifts um, or, you know, separated timelines. But if consciousness is like water within space, 
And we've been doing this thing where we've constantly been diverting it out of adversarial concepts. Uh, it makes sense that at the macro level, that the literal mind of God or the universe did it also. And so the more we heal ourselves as the micro, the individuation, the more we heal all these little fragments, these soul fragments that it kind of occurred within you know, the, the cosmology of, oh. of the oneness of everything. But what's super interesting is how many people start doing this, figure out that this is all an illusion and go and, and like freak out and go, I got to get out of the matrix. Yes. And they start connecting with guides or higher, higher versions of their self. And they're like, okay, how do I get out? And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not the point. You matter most of all in the equation because there's so much that we can do. There are so many little chess moves that we're capable of doing in this dimension, in this reality that makes such a huge difference at the macro that can't be done in other dimensions that it's like, no, you're supposed to appreciate the beauty of this illusion and use it to your advantage. That's why you chose it instead of going, Oh crap, it's the matrix. Get me out. Like, pull the plug. Where am I supposed to be? You're supposed to be here. So that's the most difficult thing, honestly, is that when people start waking up to the illusion, they get really scared of it. Um, and they basically, you know, the mirror gets really small and the smaller the mirror gets, uh, the scarier it can get based on how you feel about yourself. So that's probably the, the thing that I would say to be careful with people is, you know, as the mirror gets smaller, make sure that you're not looking through it with the lens of fear. Uh, you know what I love about your perspective is it's, 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 you've got a grace about you when you deliver the information, which is very appealing, but the way that you're doing this in such a calm, chill, confident way is something that's necessary for people to really get their minds around concepts like this. And what's interesting is when you meet people like you, you're you're a few rungs up the ladder, but you've got something to offer for everybody as far as uh, perception goes, because you've really got an awesome, well-rounded way of looking at this stuff. You've already even transcended, you know, redefined a duality, which is very interesting to me. And I think that people find people at different levels of their experience when they're ready, you know, as when the student is ready, the master will appear, right? And so this is why it's really fun to have you on now, because we're all ready for this. We're all ready for Mira and to tell us uh, what to look <laughs> at, right? Because Mira is look in Spanish. So uh, let me let me ask you this. Let's have some fun with this, because I uh, we'll wrap it up here soon. But I wanted to ask you some, like, fun stuff. What's your favorite whimsical, d just something that's crazy on this plane or this planet this reality that just blows your mind about like the natural world or something like that. Doesn't even have to be human psychology. Oh gosh. Um, wow. That's a great question. Do you want me to give you one for reference? Uh, what's that? Do you want me to give you mine for reference? Sure. That would be awesome. Actually. Kangaroos check this shit out. So mother kangaroos have the pouch. They have a vaginal live birth and they lick a trail of uh, up for the little baby that can't see anything that's born vaginally and then crawls up into the pouch, right? That's not the cool part. The cool part is, is that in the mom's pouch, it has two different nipples that secrete two completely separate biologically formulated for the growth and development of that age of animal that they've got in them. So the very one at the very bottom, which would be the smallest of the entities, has a very colostrum packed type of a formula to it so it's very strong that's what they need at that age now the higher one is when a normal a bigger joey right a little baby is much further along in its development and also occupying the same pouch because they stay in there for quite a bit but the mom can have two different age births at the same time and feed them nutritionally from her own body completely separately at their different stages of development i think that's fascinating that is super fascinating actually I and i right? i know a lot about i, I spent most of my childhood watching animal planet obviously because i grew up under a bed i'm obsessed <laughs> with shit like that i'm obsessed but i didn't with know like that. that well so that's what we're I, here to do is learn and grow and teach each other stuff so teach me your favorite <laughs> exactly. thing about the natural world <laughs> so oh gosh okay so i'm gonna be a psychology nerd about it okay which is i think the thing that's you know really kind of just like Need, like endlessly open my eyes to the idea of how wondrous the world is, is this concept that one time, time technically is an illusion. 
Um, and two, that that means that you have always had a time machine. <laughs> right here uh and what i you know most people are going what do you mean i can't go back to 1981 and like you know ha have a 25 cent or a 25 cent coffee or donut or whatever if it was even that much then uh, what i mean to say is through perception through consciousness you have this amazing ability to not only change or alter the past by the way you're choosing to look at it and the way you're choosing to approach it within your own mind, but you also have the ability to literally shape your future and your reality from the present, which I think is, you know, waking up to that one can also feel a little scary because then you can't be a victim to anything again ever. <laughs> nope. And then you realize your spirit guides are just you from the future. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I trip out over that one for sure. Uh, finish uh, go a little bit more on that thought i wanted to see where you take that to next okay um well you know let's do let's do a perception game i love doing it actually it, i always do it with the religious stuff which you know people are like oh it's so religious based but i'm like it shapes so much of society so i have to so one of the really like holy shit moments for me as I've done like perception work in my own mind and, and dictionary of self and changing the way I view things is I don't know how many people know about the concept of the Leviathan in uh, the Bible or, or in, in biblical scripture, basically, which is this primordial sea serpent that comes about at the end of the at the end of the world. And it's referred to as the Hellraiser. So the more I got into understanding like quantum physics, how consciousness works, how, how science is really coming to, to understand that it's frequency and that the whole point of ascension is to raise your frequency. Well, if hell is a frequency that you're living in, doesn't seem so bad to be raising it, does it? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, and I, this came about because I've studied so many different forms of spirituality and in every one there, you know, there's the serpent basically in most forms of spirituality, except for Orthodox religion, the serpent is connected to wisdom, the moon, Kundalini, uh, emotive bodies, you know, everything that basically we've been told to vilify. <laughs> yeah. And here we have this serpent that's supposed to come around and end the world which you know some types of worlds need ending i don't think it's i don't i don't think anyone is gonna miss the productivity bug hellish mindset we've all been uh, dude it's like that we move away from it oh, like that uh, tool song enema i r relate to that more and more uh, the older i get uh, that's great yeah in fact i will link it in the show notes for reference so there you go guys it's about oh, the end if of the that world. changes if that changes anyone's mind about uh the Leviathan not being some awful apocryphal being. <laughs> yeah, I like this, but it's it is integrating these archetypes. That's like what I've been, you exactly. know, lately and this is what we needed to hear is how to do that and like different ways to spot that, identify those so you can integrate them. You're and it's like the T one thousand from uh Terminator. Remember when he like gets blown up and then he turns to that liquid and then all of his little parts kind of pull together and then they join back up to make him? That's kind of like then a good analogy for the way that your fractured beings need to be reintegrated with you. Sometimes you need to heal your sexual healing with your, you know, whatever other issues that you've got, those kind of pull together and then you've got, you know, your uh, fear of spiders over here that's a whole different part of your brain so you kind of integrate all these things and it brings you back to this wholeness and along the way those puddles as they get bigger the parts that you need to heal need to be more balanced because they're more challenging and that's why they're bigger in mass right and then you finally come together as this one being and then you transcend the bullshit completely and then it's a nice place to be sounds like you're almost there you're like three years away from complete enlightenment how's that feel <laughs> Um, I haven't defined it away from myself in the present. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking awesome. That is the only damn way to uh, answer that question, by the way. Excellent job. Okay, what do you think aliens are? What do I think aliens are? I think that <laughs> I think that aliens are us. <laughs> I mean, how how could they not be? They're us in another form, right? Like so, you know, that that's another funny one that's sort of interesting, too, is like the concept of the reptilians. Yes. 
well, everyone has a reptilian cortex in their brain. <laughs> yeah, are we like a? It's, we have a tail as a zygote, right? That goes away in the womb. I, I, yes, yeah. I believe so. But basically, it's you know, be careful trying to vilify a part of yourself. Yeah, is the way I would say it. Instead of like. I uh, let's just say I intended to make peace within my universe between uh, like the reptilians and the grays. And, you know, what what if grays in the universe are just the gray matter in your brain? Oh, fucking deep, <laughs> you know, dude. So it's like it's seeing the it's seeing those archetypes as they come down through the reflection and going, OK, well, if I want peace in the universe, then I need to make peace in here first. Right. If I want the world to know how to properly use its energy systems and resources in a way that's efficient and healthy for the planet, I need to learn how to use my energetic resources in balance and harmony in me first. And by doing it in you first, it's actually amazing how quickly you'll start seeing it happening in the, in the macro. Okay, so you get to decide the things that stay and go in the next reality that we get to experience. So you get to do this anyway, but you're going to do it now. Uh, so what what is uh, three things that you would keep and three things you would change? Oh, okay. Three things I would keep. Um, I would keep emotions obviously <laughs> something that people want to get rid of for whatever reason i would keep duality actually uh but i would change our perception of it i would keep the self which is the individuation of consciousness of the cosmos but i would remove ego probably i refer to ego as uh the parasite to the host the host being self and sometimes when a parasite lives on you long enough, it gets really good at convincing you that it's actually a part of you. So self stays uh, and ego goes. And, and basically to meta, like to give a metaphor for what self would be, we'll use the whole like concept of the tree. Um, Cause a lot of people cosmologically like, like the concept of the tree. If you are the apple, right? You understand yourself as the apple but you also understand that you're inherently attached to the tree the same way that, you know, if your eyeball had consciousness, it would understand that it's just an eyeball, but that it's still your eyeball or that your pinky is its own thing, but it's still attached to the whole thing. So that definitely stays. Um, what's one other thing <laughs> uh there are a couple words i'd get rid of <laughs> okay let, let's hear the word i want what are the words that you would get rid of i've probably said them all tonight so no you haven't actually um so there are you know there are just derogatory words that have come about throughout time space that have been born completely from a place of ill intent um you know some of the racial slurs that have come to be the religious slurs. Um, I don't know how many people know that the word V I T C H was actually born from Nazism because that was their way of referring to, to women as female dogs. So I, that word can go for me. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what else, but no, I mean, it would be a few words. Satan, the concept of Satan might be one of them. <laughs> yeah, right. Like there's this horrible place to go that's separate from you, even though you created it to experience you because you're the only thing here. It's it's an interesting thing. I think it's just a control mechanism. You know, things like that have been hijacked uh, just like all the other institutions, but at a macro level, I think if you zoom out on it, it's here in purpose. It's like, uh, and I relate to the simulation theory a lot, but simulation and spirituality, you can say them the same. It's just, it seems to be, a little bit easier to conceptualize for a lot of people who aren't necessarily spiritual or just getting into it. They get lost in like the archangels and the dimensions and shit like that. It's a little, I find more stair steppedness to be able to introduce it in more of a artificial way, even though they're basically 
they could be said the same way. It's an organic matrix, right? It's a system uh, that's created and alive. Uh, but if you're within it, you wouldn't be able to perceive that. But maybe it's a simulation because it's really, really good. Uh, we don't know. But, uh, you know, what's interesting, too, about the simulation versus spirituality arguments when it comes to high strangeness in particular, like what you were talking about, about dimensional shifts and stuff, I think that there's a lot to this because you can see people working it out from two different perspectives. It's not like it's completely erroneous on one side, science, scientifically, let's say, because then they'll just come up with a technology that could do it, even though that technology may be rooted in spirituality because there's nothing separate, right? It's almost like the equivalent of them, um, like the Wizard of Oz, you know, when he's behind the curtain and he's pulling shit, it looks all fantastic, but really it's just nonsense, you know, but it can be achieved through something greater. It's, it's almost like that with these kind of concepts. Um, so what's one thing that's not here that you would add to your next one? This one's tricky because now you have to create something that doesn't exist and apply it to a new paradigm. Um, so I truly believe in the natural uh, biological ability for psychic connection between human beings. I think that there's been a lot to keep us from being able to utilize that both within ourselves and with each other. Um, one, because it's a very emotionally based ability, cognitive ability. Uh, but I think that, you know, I would want, I would want that. I would want us to be able to like actually experience genuine unity consciousness. Which, which is to say, like, if you wanted to share your sentience with another person for a day, um, you could do that, right? Like you could amalgamate in one vessel and then, and then separate as you please to have different experiences. See, and again, there's a technological reference for that. Judge Dredd uh, with Sylvester Sloan, I think it's Sandra Bullock, when they put those helmets on because nobody really bangs in the future. You do it with a helmet and you meet in a virtual place. Uh, it's, again, there's a technological reference for this idea and this concept, which makes it seem extra extraordinary, right? And to the time travel one, that's my favorite because it seems like dimensions, right? And if you move into a dimension that's moving or another reality that's imperceivably different from ours, but it's moving at a faster rate, that's how you time travel. You just hop into that one for a little bit and boom, now you're in the future you know, from here and then hop back out. And so these things are very spiritual, but they can also be viewed in a scientific context because the world has divided them. And I like what you're doing, which is bringing them back together. So uh, Mira Taylor, you're absolutely incredible. You are welcome back anytime. <laughs> All of the ways to find you will be linked in the show notes. And uh, y'all go check her out. She's incredible, clearly. I mean, you're just one of my favorite talk to's I've ever had. So thank you so much for your time. Wow. Thank you. so. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. Um, I don't, you know, I don't find very many people often that I get to speak about these things on. So I'm very excited to speak to an audience that has a genuine interest in the topic that we talked about too. So thank you very, very much. I can already hear everyone on Soul Space right now losing their shit over you in particular <laughs> this episode. And I just can't wait to, like I said, show you off to everybody. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so thank you so much. Like I said, you are welcome back anytime. Awesome. Well, I hope to be back when I am putting my book out, which is technically a self-guided like journaling help book crossover, but I definitely am. That's motivation for me, for sure. <laughs> that's so cool. No, you will definitely be back on for that for sure, if not before. So uh, thanks again, dude. Have a great rest of your evening. Thanks. You too. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely incredible. Uh, Mira is one of those people that is so spiritually mature that it really, it, you get to a point with your life, your own personal journey, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I think I'm on a pretty good path. And then you really just plateaued because you come across new information and moon and ruin and a person like Mira Taylor, and they just blow you away. It's just like, oh my God, okay, well, and it, it's a whole new avenue of research to go down, and it's exciting. I mean, that's that's what's great about this, is sharing these ideas, going down these rabbit holes together, and really uh, getting to the core of what makes us all tick. And that's great because it's all different, right? And you just got to pick what resonates with you. And that's why we offer a lot of cool shit here, like Mira Taylor. So check the show notes for all the ways to find her. Go book your session with her, guys. She's wonderful. And uh, down there also is going to be expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is where links to all of our stuff will be. If you want to expand your experience with us here on the show, you can do so through there. That's where all the socials and Rockfin and merchandise and all that good stuff is, guys. So uh, check that. 
and uh, the music that you're listening to, good buddy Vinny the Saint, great friend of mine, and he just makes some awesome music. He's linked down there as well, so just go check out his stuff. Uh, he's got some really cool stuff that he's coming out with, uh, a bunch of new things working, and I'm not at liberty to say, but it's going to be amazing, so stay tuned. Uh, so go check him out in the show notes as well. So go out into this beautiful place with this new information and just enjoy the fact that you're here. Uh, be nice to everyone that you come across, animal, human, reptilian, light being, whatever you got. Just, you know, put your best face forward. Like we always say, this is an, any interaction is an opportunity for you to be a greater, grander version of your true self. So take yourself up on that. While you're doing that, uh, hold the door open for somebody. Little things around here, guys. Uh, buy a coffee or a meal for someone in line behind you, around you, whatever. Uh, get out of the left-hand lane, of course, and above all and beyond, go out into this beautiful place, whatever the hell this thing is, and y'all just be good to one another. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>